All right, so central limit theorem, this is our section 6.5. Now what this is going to allow us to do is combine the theory from 6.4. We're going to apply that, our sampling distribution idea. That's, remember that was taking every possible sample, finding the statistic for it, putting it in a chart, and averaging all those results <coughs> together. And we understood a couple things about that, that the average of the sample proportions equals the population proportion. The average of the sample means equals the population mean. Same thing will happen with our variance. Now we're going to apply this to our, our central limit theorem, and that's going to allow us to do hypothesis testing in the next couple chapters. So we're, we're getting there. We're almost to the point where statistics will actually take place. We have just made the jump. You might not be super excited about this, but we just made the jump from populations, working with whole populations, which we've done the last two chapters, to actually working with samples now. Did you notice the jump? This last section lets you make the jump. We haven't done that before. Now we're going to use samples to represent populations. That's the idea for our section. So we are on 6.5. We're going to be talking about the central limit theorem. However, all the theory for it, all the hard work we did in the last section, now we just have to kind of put it in practice. However, there are some requirements that have to be met in order for you to use this stuff. Here's your requirements. First off, we're going to assume that we're sampling from a population that has some mean and some standard deviation, okay? So, from a population with a mean of mu, whatever it happens to be, and a standard deviation, sigma. We don't have to know what they are, we just have to know that they, they exist. Here's the requirements. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to really, really know these things because the requirements are going to tell you which statistic you can use, which, uh, which measure you can use for, for the next few chapters. So the first requirement is this. This is a big one. The first requirement is N. What's N stand for? Okay, yes, N is going to be a number, right? What number is it? You, you, have to, you guys have to know these. What's N? The, what, what was that? The sample of size N. That's right. So N stands for sample size. This has not changed throughout the whole course. N's got to be greater than 30. N has to be greater than 30. And if it is, Here's what you know. This is very, very, very interesting. This is part of the central limit theorem I'm telling you right here. If n's greater than 30, are you listening? It says no matter what the population looks like, no matter what, whether it's uniform distribution, whether it is uh, skewed to the left, skewed to the right, normal, a U-shaped distribution, what, no matter what the population is, if you take samples of size at over 30, at least 31, if you take samples of size at least 31, so greater than 30, and you, you find those, you remember how we're doing all the averages for all the samples, every different sample, and you organize those, the distribution will be normal. That's a pretty big statement. It says no matter what your population looks like, the distribution of sample means is definitely going to be normal. Your book actually does a really good job of explaining that. Uh, it's on page... Let's see, 289. Look at page 289. They take samples, they use a computer to do this, but they take samples of a uniform distribution of size, uh, n size 1, and you get, of course, normal. And they, or, sorry, uniform. And they say n size 10, and you get almost a normal distribution uh, after you find those things and you average them. And then they take size 50, and it's perfectly normal. It's, it's amazing. That happens also with a uniform distribution, any type of skew that you have, a normal distribution. So no matter what, what, what type of population you have, if you take a sample size of greater than 30 and you organize every possible sample that you took 
find the statistics for each one in a table, it's going to be normally distributed. So if n is greater than 30, the sampling distribution, that's what we talked about last time, of sample means, that's what you're finding is a sample mean, is normally distributed. If n is bigger than 30, if your sample size is more than 30, then once you find all those samples and you take the statistic for each one and you organize them, it will be normally distributed. That's a huge statement. Uh, I, I can tell that you, you really don't quite quite get what's happening here. Uh, so let me try to try to do this one more time. All right, remember our our uh, our class in here, and we said that your ages may or may not be normally distributed. Right? I, I honestly I don't care if they're normally distributed. If I take if we had like a class of the whole college, right? The whole college was our our population. And I took samples of at least 30. So basically, a class at a time. So if I took 30 at a time, and I found the average age for each of those classes, and I put them in order, the distribution of ages is going to be normally distributed. That's what I'm saying here. Okay. Not that each, not that the all, the ages are normally distributed. I don't even care. What I care about is that for each possible sample, if I go organize that data, it's going to be a normal bell-shaped curve. Do you with, are you with me on that? That's, that's what this is saying. Not only this, but do you remember from last time, this was a whole theory part of it, that when you took the average of the sample means, so basically the average of the averages, that was the last thing we did, that it actually equaled the population mean? Do you remember that? When I averaged, when I averaged the sample means, when I averaged the sample means. I'm using this symbol because I'm taking all the possible sample means. That's why it's mu. Stick with me up here, guys. I can tell some of you are, are zoning out already. You can't afford to zone out in this section. This is the biggest one we've covered yet in this class. Okay? Everything else was getting to this point. This symbol means all everything, right? It means the population. So this is taking every single sample mean and averaging it. That's what we did on the last example from 6.4. If you weren't here, you need to go back, go and review that video. We took every possible sample of size 2 in that case. Do you remember that? We found the average for each one, then we averaged those. This is averaging all the sample means in the sampling distribution, and we found out that this actually equals the population mean. The average of the sample means must equal the population mean. Now there was one more thing that we really didn't talk about standard deviation. Because standard deviation there's a little bit of a problem. The, the standard deviation of the sample means is not going to be the standard deviation of the entire population. Now here's why. Here's why. When you find a sample, right, you're taking a pretty large group of people, and if you put them in order, they're going to make it pretty close to the mean. It's going to kind of squeeze everyone together because you're taking people with really high ages, maybe really low ages, and you're combining them by averaging them, right, with other people who are around that probably average age for the college. It's going to mash some, some values together. If I find the standard deviation or the difference between those things, the, the average distance amongst values, it's going to be less than the population as a whole. What I'm saying is this. Um, if I took all of your ages, we have some older people in this class, we have some younger people in this class, right? There's going to be quite a spread there. Do you agree? There's going to be a, a pretty good standard deviation, whatever it is. Maybe it's uh, 3.2 years is your standard deviation. I'm making that up top of my head. Otherwise, I'm just a genius and I can do it like that. That'd be awesome. But now imagine this. If I take all of your samples of size 5, remember the size 5 thing? No, that's not even a size 30, that's a size 5, but you're going to get the picture here. If I take you five people and I average your ages, and I take you five people and I average your ages, and I take another mix of five people and average their ages, I do that for every combination of five people, 
what's the difference between the averages of those ages? It's not going to be 3.2. It's going to be a lot less than that. Because when I average out your group of five ages, I lose those people who are way, too, way, way old. I lose those people who are way young. I've now averaged you together. Does that make sense? So the standard deviation actually becomes smaller. Becomes smaller. There's less of a spread. Here's what this says. There's less of a spread amongst the averages than there is amongst the data values. When I take samples of size 30 especially, there's going to be less of a discrepancy or a distance or an average distance amongst those averages than there is amongst the whole population in, in general. Do you see the point here? So this doesn't, this doesn't happen. The standard deviation of the sample means is not equal to the standard deviation of the population. Standard deviation of the sample means. What this says is you take every single possible sample, you find its average, and then you found the standard deviation amongst those. That's what that's saying. That would be the, the groups of, you know, I know we're using five instead of 30, but so you can kind of grasp it. If I took all the groups of five in this class, all the possible combinations of groups of five, found every one of your average ages, put them in a table, all 80,000, whatever there, there was from last time, and then I found the standard deviation amongst those averages, that's this. It is not going to equal the standard deviation of the class. It's not going to be the same. It's going to be smaller. In fact, it's going to be the standard deviation of the class divided by the square root of your sample size. That's actually significantly smaller. What this says is that the standard deviation between your, your sample means is actually based on the size of the sample you take. I hope that makes sense. Let's think about this mathematically. Okay? You, you made it through math. See, right? You're, you're above, some of you are above calculus. But what happens when I divide by a larger number? What happens to the fraction as a whole? It gets bigger or smaller? I divide by a bigger number, the fraction as a whole gets, you divide by 10 or you divide by 100, the divided by 100 makes it a lot smaller, right? This is what's happening. If I take a bigger sample size, I hope you can see the, the theory here. If I take a bigger sample size, the spread amongst my averages is smaller. If I take bigger groups of you, then I average you, you're going to be even closer together, speaking of averages. Does that make sense? So as my sample size goes up, my standard deviation for my sample averages goes down, gets closer. The distances between those averages get smaller and smaller and smaller. The deviations come together. How people feel okay about what we're talking about so far? So there's a couple magic numbers here. The first one, oh, sorry, one magic number actually is 30. If your n is greater than 30 and you don't know anything much population, doesn't matter, you know for a fact the distribution of sample means is going to be normally distributed. That's huge, huge statement. You don't need to know anything about your population to make this case. You just say, hey, my sample size is large enough. I know my sample size is large enough and if it is, that's going to happen. If it is, that's going to happen. That's kind of cool, right? If my n is greater than 30, I know that the average of my sample means will equal the average of the population. I know my standard deviation of the sample means will equal the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n that's based on the sample size. Now, there is another case. What happens if, what's n mean again? 